I thank you so much for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. Lord, we lay ourselves before you, the creator of heaven and earth, and we dedicate our lives to you fresh and anew. Father, today I ask you to speak to hearts today, both here in this congregation and those who are watching online. Speak to us, Lord, into the very depth and secret places of our heart that we can know that you, Papa, you're aware of those areas and that you're touching them and you're bringing us in and bringing us out into that place that you have for us to walk in by the power and the anointing of your spirit. And everybody said, amen and amen. Well, I just want to quickly go over just the topics that we've cl- we covered. I-, I talked about lesson number one. Desire in- is a-, a godly desire is an indication of your destiny. And I encouraged you to start listening to the echoes that continue to bounce around in your heart, the ones that you sometimes push down and think that's that's not possible, that's not something that I can do, that would never be, I would never be able to do that. And yet it's like a bounce off the wall. It just keeps coming back at you. The reason that you need to listen to those is because God works his will and desire in your heart. Amen? Lesson number two, I said, uh, despise not small beginnings. Because everything God does begins in seed form. I can guarantee you Reinhard Bonnke did not become the great evangelist of Africa by becoming right out of the sh- great evangelist of Africa. Amen? Everybody starts small. And it's that place of humility that promotion comes not from the east or from the west or from the north, but comes from God who is able to lift one up and put another one down. And everybody said amen and amen. When I first started out in ministry, God said to me, I will open every door before you. Don't try to open a single door. And I can tell you that the doors that I tried to open, I got my nose smashed and my fingers pinched. And I found out that God closes doors to protect us. He closes them to protect us. And if we will be humble and walk with the Lord, He will open doors before us and He will make a way where there seems to be no way. Lesson number three. It's a good thing when your spouse says no because when God changes their heart, it's a powerful confirmation. Amen? And I used an illustration. But you know, there's another great illustration to that, and that is, or another application is, it's a good thing when you don't have the money to do it. Because when God provides the money miraculously, it's a great confirmation. There's many times in our lives, both in our personal life and in ministry, where I have said, God, it's your, if it's your will, you're going to take care of it. And if the money didn't come, I put it on the shelf and said, okay, then it must not be God. Beloved, God doesn't ask you to finance and fund his project. Now, you may have to go out and do some fundraising, but he's not going to ask you to really go into debt for all of that stuff. Amen? Lesson number four. And this comes in four, six parts because I had to learn a lot about Money and God's provision and the way that God provides. The first lesson was when you have a need, plant a seed. And the greater the need, the bigger the need. Amen. Greater the seed. Amen. The bigger the need, the greater the seed. We get taught that by Gene Sedevy all the time who was a Monsanto man, right? If you want to have a great big field, those of you who grew up on as farmers, if you got a big field, you got to buy a lot of seed. That's right. Whatever the need, plant that seed. If you want corn, you're going to plant corn. That's right. And it's the same way in the spiritual realm. And if you don't have the corn in the spiritual realm, what you can do is name that seed. Amen? I don't have any money, and I need money, but I'm going to plant my time and my energy and my effort because that's worth money. Amen? Plant that seed out of your need and call that seed what you need. Those are the four lessons that I, that I talked about. And number five, the last one I'm going to talk about and then I'm going to move into something different. 
Lesson five, know the difference between needs and weeds. God says, I will supply all of your wants according to his riches and glory. Does it say that? What does it say? I will supply all of your needs according to my riches and glory. And then you, you study that parable of the sower, and Jesus talked about weeds that grow up and choke the word, and the word becomes unfruitful in our lives, right? And I love what the Living Bible calls the, uh, describes these weeds as attractions of the world, delight in wealth, a search for success, and the lure of nice things that's put in our language right there. It's the things that we can search after and hold on to, and those things can actually choke at what God wants to do in our lives. Amen? We can hold on so tightly to these things, and the reality is the things that we hold on to tightly actually have hold of us. Have you guys ever heard about the, how they, in Africa they would, they would uh, uh, trap monkeys? I, I actually found a video on this. It was, it's an old video, and it, it looked like it was maybe back in the 30s or something, but they show these, the, the people in Africa who wanted to catch monkeys, so they would take these gourds, and they would drill a really tiny little hole in the top and put sweet things down inside that gourd. And, the, and they would uh, tether the gourd then to a tree. And so the monkey, they, they would put these where the monkeys were, and the monkeys would go up, put their little arm down into that gourd, and they would grab that sweet thing that was down in there, and then they would try to get their hand out, try to get their hand out, but they couldn't get their hand out. The reality is if they would just drop that, they could slide their hand back out. But the monkey couldn't grasp the fact that what they had hold of was trapping them. Yeah. And sometimes that's the way we are. We're just like those little monkeys. We put our hands down in there. We try to get that sweet thing that we want so badly, but it has us trapped. And in that video, you can see that monkey just going all over the place, trying to get his fist out, trying to get his hand out. And they, the trappers just came over so easily and just picked him up and carried him away. And how is that? Yeah, aw. <laughs> how, isn't that just like... We are sometimes, we hold on to the things that ensnares us. You know, I don't know how many of you remember Corey Ten Boom. Who was a, uh, she was a Dutch Christian watchmaker with her father. And during World War II, her and her family helped the Jews to escape from the concentration camps by he hiding them in her home. And uh, they, were, they were caught and... Corey Ten Boom and her family went into um, were, were put in concentration camps themselves. And her book, The Hiding Place, tells the story of her and her sister specifically and what they had to endure in, the, um, in that concentration camp. But I remember one of the quotes that she, one of the things that she said that became a, a well-known quote that I have remembered all of these years, and that was this. Hold everything in your hand lightly. Otherwise it hurts when God pries your fingers open. We got to hold on to stuff lightly. Beloved, I don't know what you and I are going to face in our nation before our life is over. But I do think it's time we learn this lesson. To hold things lightly and to know the difference between needs and weeds. Amen. Well, so far I have been talking about the things that I learned. But I have a better half who sits on this journey with me. And while I'm learning lessons, he's learning lessons. And how many of you would like to hear a couple lessons that he learned along the way? All right, Dawson, you're up. 
Come on, give it up for the big dog. Good morning, good morning, good morning. I am ready. The question is, are you ready? My lessons will be pretty brief. Now, you can attribute that either to the fact that I'm too eager to learn lessons or that <laughs> I, am, I am smarter than the average bear, but I, I'll let you decide that. Now, before I start, I have to inject a little bit of humor. Will you allow me that, that grace? Now, we don't want any party poopers out here. We just don't. If I say something funny, you have to laugh. So it just keeps me in the whole spirit. I feel today like I'm a little bit like Paul Harvey telling the rest of the story. You know, she's told you her side of the story. Now I get to tell you the rest of the story, what really happened. And then also, if I really pull you back. Remember the, the uh, TV series, Mr. Ed? The horse that never talked unless, unless he had something to say. So I am like Mr. Ed today. I have something to say, so I'm going to talk. Usually I don't, I don't want to talk. And, you know, Connie started this series, and we talked about me sharing my story. And, um, you know, I thought at the time it was a good idea until about yesterday afternoon. I said, why, why did I do this? I could have just kept my mouth shut and just sat there quietly in the front aisle and just been, been fine. But, um, but no, sometimes you just have to go with, the, go with the flow, you know. So I thought I'd just share a little bit about, just about myself. And the first thing I want to show you is a picture of my pride and joy. Would you like to see that? <laughs> so there is my pride and joy. Now, I also have another picture. The next picture is, is my pride and joy. This for a long time was, was my pride and joy. This is Connie, of course, and our puppy that we got in China, Xiao Bai. And so, you know, before Connie and I were married, I, I was a, the manager of some restaurants in town. I had four restaurants and about 60 people, so I was kind of used to having some elevation of honor. You know, people would, Mr. Dawson, how are you doing today? Well, it wasn't long after Connie and I got married, I became known as Connie's husband. <laughs> Who's that guy? Well, that's Connie's husband. Well, then we went to China and we got Xiao Bai. And Xiao Bai was the, the most famous dog in China. And I'll tell you a little story about that. But before long, I became known as Xiao Bai's dad. <laughs> so that was my descent into greatness. You know, the kingdom, God's kingdom is upside down. So I, get, I went down to becoming Xiao Bai's dad. Xiao Bai was a white Pekingese that we got in China, and we, we didn't know what to name it, so we kind of went to uh, language school, and the teacher said, uh, a good name for it would be Xiao Bai Yuan, which means little white cloud. And so that was her name. So we called it for short, we called her Xiao Bai. Well, I would take Xiao Bai out for a walk, and uh, the Chinese, they didn't know her name, but they would say, look at that little, little white dog. They would say, Xiao Bai Go, which means little white dog. And so everywhere we went, people would say, Xiao Bai Go, look at the little white dog. And so Xiao Bai would hear her name, and she'd, she'd look up and say, they know me, they love me. So she was the most famous dog in China. Every place she went, they would say, Xiao Bai Go. And she'd be looking at him saying, hi, I'm, I'm here. And so she was the, <clears throat> a famous dog because, because of her name. Now, Connie told you the story of how she left St. Elizabeth and went into the ministry. And uh, the other part of that story is that when she stopped her job, half of her income disappeared. And so we were like typical Americans, you know, no matter how much money we made, we always managed to spend just a little bit more than what we, what we made. And so now all of a sudden we have, we're on half of our income. And some, you know, somehow the equation of 
cutting our expenses in half never happened. So we were kind of trying to stay above water. I was trying to stay above water anyway. And so she would be, you know, I'd be saying, you know, Connie, it would probably be a good idea for you to get a job because, you know, we need to pay our bills. And she's saying, well, we, we've got to go on. And then, and then she decided that I came home one day and she says, uh, we're going to China. I'm, I'm frantic here because we're not making ends meet now. And then she's talking about going to China. I have no idea of how we can go to China. And so that's when I said, you may be going to China, but I'm not going to China because I just didn't know how we're going to do it. But I was always, I was always excited to go visit China. So we, we were able to arrange a trip where we went for six weeks to visit China. And it, it was absolutely fantastic. You know, it was just, just anything you could imagine. Just, you know, you could see the need, you could see the, what you could do there and the potential, and it was just wonderful. And so Connie's saying, well, I'd like to go to China. Well, I, you know, I was managing four restaurants, and I was at the age where, you know, you don't just walk away from that and then six months later say, you know, oops, I, you know, we, I need to have a job because you don't just walk back into a good-paying job. You have to go back and start from the beginning. At that age, my age, I wasn't going to do that. So I had to make sure that I knew that if we were going to go to China, that I had to have a clear word from God that we, we were supposed to go. So we came back to China, came back from China, and came back to America, and I had a meeting with my two partners, and they, they basically bought me out. And so that was my clear word that we were going to China. So I came back home to Connie and said, God has spoken to us. We're going to China. And so we began getting ready to go to China. And so from the time we got home until the time we went back to China, it was only a six-week period. And so from that point on, we started getting ready to go to China. And so it was exciting. We, you know, our life was going to change. But there's also the other side of this. I had worked 20 years in the restaurant business. And I had put all my time and energy into to creating these businesses that, and many, many, many times, and I know many of you can, can relate to this, I would be going through a tough time and I'd say, you know, this is, this is terrible, but someday I'm going to get a reward for all this hard work. For the price I'm paying for 20 years, the price I'm paying to keep these restaurants going, to keep them working, I'm going to get a reward. Okay, so now I'm at the end of my restaurant career, and the reward didn't come. I got some money back. I got basically the money I'd put into the business. I got that back out. But there was, there was no reward that I expected. The big reward that I expected at the end of the, end of the race wasn't there. And so I was in a dilemma. On one side, I was so excited to go to China. On the other side, I was crushed by what had happened with the business. I had spent 20 years. My life had been dedicated to that business. I mean, it's seven days a week. 65, 70 hours a week working. And all of a sudden, it's gone, and there's nothing. I can't see anything worth, worth to show for it. And so I would go to the Lord, and uh, this was just a private conversation between me and the Lord. Because, I could, you know, everybody else, I was telling how excited I was about going to China. But I'd go to the Lord and say, you know, Lord, I'm crushed. Where is my reward for all the labor I put into these businesses? What happened to it? And while I was praying that, the Lord would show me two treasure chests. One would be my earthly treasure, treasure chest. One would be my heavenly treasure chest. And so I'd open up my earthly treasure chest, and inside there was a stack of bills, the money that I had gotten back from the business. It wasn't it wasn't 
in my opinion, it wasn't much. It was just the bare minimum of what I should have gotten. And the other was my heavenly treasure chest. Well, I know, I knew what I had done the last 20 years of my life. I knew where I had put my time, my effort, and where my heart was. And so the Lord would say, you know, you need to open the heavenly treasure, heavenly treasure chest. And I'd say, Lord, don't ask me to do that. I know what I've done. I know where my treasure should be. It should be right here. And it's not there. Don't ask me to look in the heavenly treasure chest because I know that's going to be vacant. I'm already crushed. Don't ask me to go look there. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it. And this went on for a period of a couple weeks, two, three weeks. I'd be, I'd be, every time I go to prayer, this, this vision would flash before my eyes of the two treasure chests. Now I want to just read a, a scripture that applies to this. Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. That was the tough part. Where your treasure is, there is your heart also. I knew, I knew where my heart had been. I knew where the treasure should have been, and it wasn't there. So this goes on for a couple of weeks, and then we're just about ready to go to China, and, and the Lord impressed that I should share this with the church on a Sunday morning. So on a Sunday morning, I get ready to share this. And as I'm praying before I go in there, God prompts me again. He said, look at your heavenly treasure chest. And he said, don't ask me. And he said, look at your heavenly treasure chest. So finally, I relented. And I, in my prayers, I opened up my treasure chest. And to my shock, it was full of gold bars. And I said, God, where did these come from? And he would have me pick up a bar, and he would remind me of something I had done. And then I'd pick up another bar, and he'd remind me of something else I'd done. You see, I had put all my efforts into this worldly treasure chest. But all that I'd put in there, all the efforts, all the deposits I put in, someone had stolen them. They were gone. But the deposits I put into my heavenly treasure chest were there. God had protected them, protected them. God had blessed them. They had multiplied. And so that was my, that was the event. That was the, the hook that we could hang our going to China. From that point on, I never, the 10 years we were in Asia, we never once looked back and said, should we be here? Are we doing the right thing? I knew that we were doing the right thing because from that point out, I said, what we need to work for is not our earthly treasure chest, but our heavenly treasure chest. And so that was, had been, has been my story for the 20 years since that happened. But now, I think comes the best part because I've been thinking about this for the last two or three weeks and this, this vision came back to me and this, all these sensations became real to me again when we started talking about me sharing this with everybody again. And so I, I would start just praying about it and asking the Lord to speak to me about it. And, um, and while I was doing that, God reminded me, he said, you know, remember when you picked up those bars, those golden bars that were in your heavenly treasure chest? Were those, were those really big deposits that you made? I said, no, God, those are just little, little acts of kindness that I did along the way, just in helping a friend or, or just, you know, being available for somebody at a bad time or, you know, it's just 
would do little things. But my, my whole paradigm shifted. I realized that what we think is important, the things we think are important, the, the things that we work so hard, our jobs, you know, having success, getting a job done, you know, getting, being, having a nice car, having a nice house, having a nice clothes, all those things that we consider so important in God's world, those are not important. What is important is what we do on a daily basis to the people that surround us and the people that we have interaction with. If we could just grasp, and this has been my paradigm shift. This has been what has changed in my heart the last two weeks is that God has spoken to me and said, what you need to focus on are not going to work and getting a job done, but going to work and making sure that the people you work with, I work for Lincoln Public Schools with special needs students, that each one of those students know that you love them and that you are going to, you are there to, to support them and to help them. And just this last week, I had an experience where I'm working with one of the students and I'm just talking to him and say, how are you doing today? And he's going, I'm doing okay. Well, what's going on? Well, you yelled at me yesterday. I go, what? He said, you yelled at me. I can't remember what I did, but I know that what we were doing is some work, and I'm sure that what I did was raise my voice to get his attention. And so, I, you know, before this, I would have just said, well, you know, I'm, you know, I didn't mean anything by it. Let's just move on. But that just hurt my heart. So I went back to that student and said, you know, I'm sorry that I did I raise, raise my voice at you. Will you forgive me? You, I, want, I want to be your friend. Would you, would you just forgive me? And I worked the rest of that day just saying, you know, just building that, trying to build that relationship back with him so that he could trust me and that he would understand that I was, you know, all of a sudden my paradigm shifted. What we were doing, we're hanging some hooks for lights at the children's zoo. The idea that, you know, before I'm thinking, this is really important, I got to get this done. All of a sudden that disappeared. And all I could think about was how am I going to make sure that my interaction with these students is one that I'm going to build relationship with them every day. Not just one or two, but the whole group of them. Because each one of them have a special need. Each one of them have problems that I need to address. And it's, and it's just challenging my heart to, to rethink what's really important and what's not important. I have one last picture I just want to show you. This is one of our students at the school, and he is, uh, there's another student that's on the bus. And this student every day has a problem getting off the bus. So there's a teacher and a, another pair like me that go in there and try to get this student off the bus. And this student is standing outside the bus. And he's just cheering him on. Come on. Come on. Get off the bus. Come on. Come on. You can do it. Come on. Now, I'm purposely not using any names. I purposely took the picture so you can't see him. But imagine I'm learning something from, this, from these students. They take the time to just stand there and encourage someone to get off the bus. So the, the question I have for everybody here today is we all have two treasure chests. We have our earthly treasure chest and we have our heavenly treasure chest. And so what I'd like to ask you today is to consider with me, where are you making your deposits? What is important? 
what is really important is a time to, to, to pause and to say, you know, I've, I've lost focus. I've got worried about, you know, my, how important my job is, how important it is to, to uh, make sure that I'm right and that I make sure they understand the right way to do things. You know, sometimes just really not that important. What's really important is that they understand that they are valued and loved. And so are there relationships in your life that you need to stop and pause and say, it's important for me to, to not worry about whether I'm right or wrong in this situation, but that I'm loving the person that is in front of me. It might be your, you know, it might be your, one of your kids, it might be your, your spouse, maybe your, your in-laws or outlaws or whoever, whoever you're having a confrontation with. Is it really that important to win or is it more important to know that, that they know that you love them? And so that has been what's excited, been exciting for me the last couple of weeks is that God took this whole treasure chest and just lit my whole heart of it, around it and made me realize that the important thing is not only that we make deposits in our heavenly treasure chest, but we really consider the people that we deal with and, and let them see the love of Christ come through us. And the way they see it is by our actions, not by just our words. Jesus.